Now we're going to continue uh, the discussion of silica and its removal um, and effects by listening to Nick Milne, also from VU, um, and obviously has a, a lot of knowledge on this subject as well. Okay, thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, so what I'm due to talk about here today effectively is part of the literature review that we did into this process and part of our selection criteria of some of the techniques that we saw Peter studying then. The idea is to give a bit more of a background, however, into actual silica chemistry and what the current state of the knowledge is, and also on a range of different techniques that are being used. Um, I'll have to set the scene a little as part of this talk to give an idea of the sites that we were dealing with and the problems they were facing, because I've given um, similar talks in the past in other parts of the world, and they feel that the solutions that we're looking at are too complex and there are much simpler ones. However, that's because of the local conditions that they're dealing with. So it's important to always consider those local conditions when you're looking at these sorts of processes. Um, so as a bit of a background, we're all aware that Eastern Australia has emerged from an extended period of drought about two and a half, three years ago now. Um, however, of course, we're also hearing that that La Nina weather pattern has probably come to an end, so we're probably about to start the next one. Um, so this is something that's going to become important again probably in the next five years or so. Um, there's also a lot of water scarcity still existing, particularly in the inland areas of Australia and particularly in some of our mining areas. Um, during periods of water shortage, the demand on groundwater increases significantly, particularly at a lot of mining sites where the surface water drops off. Um, and unfortunately, of course, replenishment is at its lowest at that point. So we need to maximise the amount of groundwater that we're using. The minerals industries that are operating in Australia are generally in remote locations in both the north and the west of the country. Um, and there is this need, because of their, remote, like their remoteness, to more efficiently use the water, as I was saying before. We're also seeing an increasingly strict environmental regime. Um, which is making brine management a lot more problematic in that a lot of the aquifer recharge that was being used or um, disposal isn't really available at these sites anymore. Um, for the coal seam gas industry in particular in Queensland at the moment, they are only looking at evaporation ponds as the only solution for their water. Over the next 20, 20 years, it's anticipated that it's going to cost somewhere around $5 billion to build the evaporation ponds necessary just for the ones that are currently being explored and used. Um, with the growth in New South Wales and potentially in other parts of the country, that value will go up. It represents somewhere around 5,000 hectares of evaporation ponds in south southern Queensland. So there is a very important need here also to reduce the amount of waste that is being generated or waste water that's being generated by this industry. High recovery, high recovery desalination has largely been focused on reducing hardness. There's a lot of work in the literature that looks specifically at calcium and magnesium and trying to reduce the impact of scale from that. There has been a lot less of a work done into silica removal. And what seems to be the case in the literature at least is we see a lot of these techniques that get used to try and remove the calcium and the magnesium hardness problems and what they tend to have next is silica or barium. Um, and silica, of course, the ones that we typically look at, processes like HERO, um, they tend to require significant pH shifts. Now, the waters we're looking at with the coal seam gas industry are very highly buffered. We saw in Peter's presentation before, we're talking somewhere around three grams of inorganic carbon. That is roughly about 13 grams per litre of um, alkalinity as calcium carbonate. So it's a very significant amount of um, buffering capacity in that water. And when we consider the remoteness of the sites and the need to ship chemicals to these sites, it just becomes impossible to consider those sorts of pH changes. Importantly, the silica that does tend to form is a very poorly removable scale. Um, we saw earlier from Marlene's work that generally they don't recommend any chemicals necessarily for the removal of silica. It's not entirely true. There are some chemicals that we can try and get away with, but they're particularly nasty. Things like hydrofluoric acid and ammonium bifluoride that a lot of companies are very uncomfortable working with. Um, and because of that, 
that generally means that once we start to see scale on membranes or other systems that is very heavily silica based, we tend to just throw them away because that's, that's seen as the safest way of dealing with them. Okay, so the challenge for the sites we were dealing with, um, we need to improve the desalination recovery by removing silica, but there were four criteria that the process had to meet. One was that there could be no production of a sludge. Now this came about because of the location of the sites. They are hundreds of kilometres from any major centres and they don't really have, don't feel they have the facilities to dispose of sludges as opposed to wastewaters. They're more comfortable disposing of waters than they are of solids. As I said before, we can't alter the pH simply because of that buffering capacity and the ability to bring the chemicals we need to the site. The silica concentration also has to meet necessary water quality standards. Now this eliminates a couple of techniques as we'll see later and that's primarily because the water does go to use in boilers. So we don't want 50 parts per million of silica coming through into a boiler effectively. We need to make sure that the amount of silica coming through is still of a very good quality, so five parts per million or less in most cases. Um, there was also a requirement at the time that we didn't want to interfere with the chemistry of some of the other salts of the system. And this is because some of those salts could be quite valuable in the future and they wanted to be able to extract them commercially. So that also limited us in terms of the pH that we were using and it made things a little bit complex for um, the solutions. There was ultimately also a focus towards an interstage removal technique. The reason for this is that the plant was basically half built. The first stage of desalination was already in place. So either we try and modify that process or we just whack something on the end. And whacking something on the end looked like the most appropriate option. However, having said that, we did have a look at all the different techniques that were available. Now, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about a contentious issue, and that is silica chemistry and what we actually know about it. Um, there are a lot of different arguments that exist as to exactly what is going on. I'm going to try and present what I feel based around what I've seen and both in the literature and also experimentally what I feel is going on in terms of silica chemistry. Now at the same time I'm going to point something out. I'm going to be talking like a carbon scientist, not an inorganic chemist and that's largely because the chemistry of silica is incredibly similar to carbon chemistry and organic chemistry in that we see the formation of polymers. The position of silica just below carbon in the periodic table is part of the reason for this ultimately. So I'll be talking about monomers, dimers, trimers, oligomers and polymers along the way. And that's a, it's a very important thing to say or see and recognise. Now the existence of silica in water basically comes around from the fact that we have so much silica in the crust in the form of different minerals and it is able to be dissolved within the crust under different conditions, whether that be high pressures and temperatures, but in particular it's catalyzed by hydroxide and fluoride ions present in the water. Now it's interesting because while that will catalyze dissolution, there's theories out there that it also catalyzes precipitation. So it does work both ways somehow. And this is where the chemistry can become somewhat complex. I've provided here a graph where you can see the um, concentration of silica at different pHs and different temperatures. This is a theoretical graph that's been developed based around the assumption that the water is clean of any other compound. That's very important to recognize that because so many other compounds influence the solubility of silica. Um, so this graph, which is set here from 25 to 70 degrees, will hold under certain conditions, but it won't necessarily hold under all conditions. And this is one of the really important things that we're discovering. Um, there's work that's been done out there that we say that the solubility of silica goes up with temperature. There's actually been some work done in the past that seems to suggest that that's not really even true either, that there's a bit of a flip at about 90 to 95 degrees where the silica solubility starts to drop off again. And when we're talking about some of the thermal desalination techniques, that becomes a very important point to make as well. Silica in water exists primarily in groundwater 
as a monosilicic acid, or the silica monomer, as I'll be calling it. It can exist out on its own as a non-ionic um, material at pHs below about 9. It starts ionising above 9, and you end up with this, the um, monovalent anion. There is also a divalent anion that becomes more important as you go even higher. Now, when you get these two species together, and you can also get it with the non-ionic form, you see dimerization, which is an interaction between chemical interaction that you end up with the dimer of the silica. And that from there can continue to grow to the te trina, tetramer, and so on and so forth, just like polymer chemistry. Um, what is interesting to note is that as the reaction goes on, the anionic form is more stable than the non-ionic form. The anionic form of these compounds are generally more reactive, which means that as the polymerization occurs, it produces a reactive, more reactive material that can then continue that reaction. What it means is that in a lot of the waters that we study, we see not just monosilicic acid, but we also see some short chains, we see cyclic polymers, and then we see colloidal and particulate material as well. And all of this is very important to understand because the way in which they interact with different materials will change. The way in which they cause scale to form in systems changes. It also makes it difficult for us to predict what type of antiscalants to use because while one antiscalant can work very well to prevent monosilicic acid from absorbing and causing one form of scale, it's not necessarily as effective against some of the other um, chains and polymers and colloidal material. So we need to get a better understanding of exactly what sort of silica we actually have in our waters. And that's some of the work that we're doing with our new PhD student at the moment, is trying to get a better characterization of silica using a range of different techniques that we can then bring back and get a better idea of how to do that on a regular routine basis in a lab. Another important piece of information here, which is where Tony Tarquin's technique ultimately comes in, is that there's an induction time to the precipitation. And what that means is that initially we can have a lot of silica in water, but it doesn't necessarily start to polymerize straight away. It can stay there for quite some time. It ultimately means that we can temporarily have supersaturated solutions of silica under the right conditions. Now this induction time decreases with increasing pH. So at low pH, we've got a longer induction period. The induction time also decreases with increasing temperature. It decreases with increasing silica, and also the presence of different salts will play with this induction time. So things like from memory calcium and magnesium will decrease the induction time, but there are other compounds um, from memory that carbonates, sorry, the chlorides will increase the induction time, whereas carbonates will decrease. And this is where, some, as well, some of the chemistry becomes compli complicated because you wouldn't expect the anions of the solution to be interfering with other anions ultimately in the solution. But the important thing to take away from this is that we can temporarily have supersaturated solutions. Another important point to make is the interaction of silica with metals. Now, all metals have hydroxyl groups sitting on the surface. Um, silica, the bond that you're seeing here with the metal and the hydroxide is very similar to what we saw earlier with the monosilicic acid and they do interact in roughly the same way. This is what brings about some of the starts of scaling in metal systems. Same sorts of things are expected to occur in some of the organic systems for membranes. Um, more importantly, in solution, metal hydroxides will react in exactly the same way as well, and this brings around another type of scale formation, which is our metal silicates. Um, as we get the ionic form of this silica, this reaction becomes, uh, the material becomes more reactive, so we're more likely to see those silicates form. Silica scale itself is almost never crystalline as silica. So if you've got pure silica scale, it's generally an amorphous mass that sits on the surface of your membrane or your metal. 
it can take on two different forms. It can be more gel-like or more glass-like, and there are ways we can actually tell which one you've got using FTIR. The gel-like materials tend to be more hydrated, they tend to be more open, and we can have some success at removing those sorts of things with caustic, simply because the caustic can accelerate the um, dissolution of the silica and it can penetrate into the gel far more easily than the glass-like material. Glass-like materials are effectively completely uh, dehydrated, so there's a lot of cross-linking, if you like, in the polymer, which means they're more dense, they're more difficult to get to penetrate, and they're almost impossible to remove. Even with fluorines, you're looking at generally extended periods of time to try and pull this sort of silica away. There are two main mechanisms. This isn't all of them. These are just the two significant ones we see. One is an adsorption-based process where primarily the monomeric silica attaches to the surface of the material. That sort of deposition would look something like what we see in the bottom picture here, in that it's generally non-uniform, because you get one point where a monomer absorbs, and then you get polymerization from that point. In a membrane system, the second one, adherence, um, gives a more uniform coverage. And that's not necessarily what's happened in this particular case here, but that sort of type of scale is generally indicating that you've got a more colloidal deposition of silica on the surface because the silica is formed in solution and polymerizes there and then starts to attach itself to the surface of your membrane. Silicate scale is slightly different in that it generally involves some form of metal group. They are generally crystalline, but they don't have to be. They can be amorphous. They will often start as amorphous materials and convert very quickly to a more crystalline form. Um, in RO chemistry, we focus on the four there, magnesium, calcium, aluminium, and iron, because they're the ones we most commonly see. Um, that doesn't mean that they are the worst. That doesn't mean that they are the only ones. Um, some of the worst sorts of scales with silicates that you're likely to see are actually with copper. High levels of copper in water will drop out silica very quickly as a copper silicate, and it is something that is very, very insoluble and difficult to remove. Importantly, there's an inverted solubility, which means as the temperature goes up, the salts become less soluble, so they're more likely to precipitate. What that means in practice is that thermal techniques often have even more problems with these materials than RO. Thermodynamically, as you can see from the graph on the right here, in the acidic areas, a lot of these materials are very highly soluble. But that's only theoretically. From a kinetic point of view, it is very dependent on the structure. If you have a material where the silica is, um, where you have the, sorry, the metal oxide is bonded to silica all around, the acid conditions break that metal oxide bond. So you can remove that one atom, but the silica then prevents you from going any deeper into the structure. So the dissolution rate slows down dramatically from that point. And what it means is, while thermodynamically you know you can do it, kinetically it just takes too long that it generally doesn't happen. Um, the four salts we have over this side, by the way, um, are zonotlite and wollastonite, which are two commonly found calcium scale species. And you can see they scale predominantly in that area around 9 to 10 pH. Um, the purple line is talc, so a magnesium silicate salt. And the green line represents analcyme, which is an aluminium-based one. The important thing to recognize here is that the solubility of this aluminium silicate is still quite low, even at pHs around 4. We see similar things for other metal systems, such as copper as well where they're very insoluble up to pHs of 2 and 3, which means even under acidic conditions, we can still form their scale species. Okay, high recovery RO, the first technique I wanted to talk about was the one with our collaborator, Tony Tarquin, from the University of Texas, El Paso. We know that silica, silica polymerization can be catalyzed by the presence, if you like, of hydroxide, but it's also other things in the solution. So things like magnesium and calcium really help that along. 
um, but there is this induction period. So while theoretically silica is more soluble at the high pH, we can actually operate at low pH more effectively because we are using that induction period. Taking that low pH and timing it appropriately with um, Tony's been able to get um, RO up to 96% recovery and produce water that is still five parts per million silica. Now the reason I add that last bit of course is as we drop the pH we get a non-ionic silica species mainly present which means it's more than likely going to pass through the RO system. But we're still getting the sort of rejections that we were looking for um, or that Tony was looking for with these waters. Now I had said they're timed appropriately. One of the drawbacks of this technique at the moment is that it is only a batch technique. It can't be used on a continuous basis. That's partially because of the way in which if you've got silica in there for a very long time, even though you're trying to draw something out, you've got that induction period is going to be overcome and you can potentially drop everything out. So there needs to be some changes made to the way we implement this technique in order to make it a more either continuous or more likely semi-continuous semi-batch to actually produce water on a reliable basis. Another one I wanted to talk about is another one of our collaborators at the University of Texas El Paso, Professor Tom Davis, um, and it's electrodialysis metathesis. Now what I want to talk, just show first is the concept of electrodialysis, which effectively sees us pump a brine into the centre one here. We have an anionic um, selective membrane, oops, sorry, I've got the feed pumped in to those two sides. We've got a cationic selective membrane on one part, anionic on the other, and we alternate all the way through our stack. What it means is that the cations can pass from the feed into the brine in one direction, but then they can't pass any further and get trapped in that chamber. We can do the same with chlorides coming the other way. Um, ultimately, this is just, the, as I said, the general electrodialysis technique. It lets us, by controlling the flow rates and controlling the rate way in which we do this, we can get massive increases in the concentration of the salt in that brine stream while producing a feed of a decent quality. The other process with this metathesis is trying to be described here. Instead of just using an anionic exchange membrane and a cationic one, we start going to selective anionic and cationic exchange membranes. This is one way in which this process can be set up. Um, here we're using a divalent anionic selective membrane and a divalent cationic selective membrane. And what that means is that the divalent salts can pass through and get trapped in a chamber, while the monovalents can't. So effectively what we're doing here is we have our feed, which in this case is in Alamogordo and has a very high level of calcium sulfate, very highly insoluble. If we were to use our traditional EDR technique, we would be limited by the solubility of um, the calcium sulfate in our recovery. By doing it this way, we allow the calcium to be mixed with chloride, but not the sulfate. And on the other side, sodium and sulfate ends up being mixed and no calcium should come in. So we now get limited by the solubility product of a much more highly soluble species. So we're able to push this a lot more and ultimately we get two very highly concentrated streams of sodium sulfate and calcium chloride which we can then mix later on to recover our calcium sulfate. The product in this case then goes back to an RO process. There was a problem however with this and that was silica. Silica doesn't interact with electrodialysis in terms of removal, does interact wonderfully in terms of scale formation. Um, what the solution was found to be in this case was actually to use a desalination membrane that allowed the passage of silica. So instead of actually trying to keep the silica in the brine, they allowed it through into the product. Because it's a drinking water, the regulations aren't as high as for things like boilers. So um, from memory in Australia, it's uh, 80 parts per million in drinking water is allowed, or 50 at the, is, is one other number that gets thrown around. If you've got a reasonable amount in your feed, you can allow it to pass through that desalination membrane. Keep trying to trap the other salts and leave it. In our process, however, that wasn't going to be suitable. Because we've got these boilers, we can't allow the silica to pass through. 
Um, the metathesis technique is similar to the technique used for commercial salt regeneration in Japan. I should point that out. The recovery that they're getting in Alamogordo, last I heard, was 98%, but Tom Davis was making a couple of um, changes to it, and he reckons he can get it to 99% without a problem and start producing saleable sodium chloride. Um, but as I said, silica had a very significant negative impact in terms of scaling that system. Now, one of the things that gets discussed a lot about alkaline removal, theoretically, as we saw before, silica should become more soluble as we get down into the uh, high, as we go to higher pH. But it's been described by others that the kinetics favour precipitation. Part of that comes down to the fact that that extra solubility comes down from the formation of the ions and also from different dimers, trimers and polymers. As we're starting to form those, we're effectively starting to precipitate the material. So the solubility, extra solubility comes about from effectively partially dropping the silica out of solution is one way to think about it. And the problem is these techniques are used quite a lot, high pH, to drop and remove silica from solution. A lot of it, though, comes down as well to the presence of different salts in there and dropping out silicates, but not just dropping out silicates. Importantly, magnesium hydroxide is a wonderful solvent for silica. So if we can manage to form enough magnesium hydroxide in the, at the same time, then we can absorb a lot of silica and drop that out of solution as well. Um, Ning and co-workers, uh, who is ultimately Tony Tarquin, his research group have used lime softening and they achieved a 97% recovery doing this. However, they had a significant amount of calcium scale because there was significant calcium residual within their water. So while they were getting a 95%, 97% recovery, they were scaling up their membranes rather quickly. Um, Gabalich, who is um, with UCLA, um, Uram Cohen's research group, uh, they instead went to a caustic adjustment system. They accepted the higher costs and they were able to get a 98% recovery, but they still had significant silica scale. And part of the reason for this they felt was that there was a very significant variation in the incoming water quality in terms of buffering capacity, in terms of magnesium concentration. And if you weren't precipitating enough magnesium, you weren't effectively removing the silica. If you weren't, they also found that they weren't at times adding enough sodium hydroxide to actually start a lot of these precipitation reactions and their um, system wasn't responding well enough. Um, so again, there, there are these problems in terms of control and trying to get the control systems um, to work well enough for the environment in which we put them. The other side from our point of view in this particular project is the sludge from magnesium hydroxide production is very poorly dewaterable and also it's a sludge which they specifically stated they didn't want. So effectively this technique gets removed for that reason. Electrocoagulation, another technique. Um, it's really not for monomeric silica removal. You have to know what silica you've got. It's good for colloidal silica removal. Effectively what we're doing is producing aluminium um, in situ and using those salts to assist in the coagulation process. Now the presence of aluminium will help to some extent with reactive silica reduction, um, but not to any great extent in this particular case. The only real benefit of going down the electrocoagulation role um, area is that it does supposedly produce a much lesser volume of sludge, um, but the initial investment is a lot higher. Again, it's still producing a sludge, so it was eliminated from the rest of our studies, but it was um, is just there for full consideration. So we saw some of these reactions before. This is our adsorption process. We know that silica interacts with metal hydroxide surfaces, so why not try and utilise that more effectively? Um, almost any metal oxide, metal oxide or hydroxide will do these reactions. What's important to notice is that it's not a traditional adsorption process or not the adsorption process we like to model in our heads where we get a nice monolayer. That just doesn't happen because, again, we form a nice reactive surface when the silica is adsorbed, and that silica just loves to polymerize. So we can adsorb a monomer, adsorb another monomer to get a dimer attached to the surface, a trimer, and so on. 
what's important to notice is that every one of these reactions is very highly reversible. So we can actually also have a trimarine solution that will react with that metal surface, but it can then start to depolymerize. And that's what seems to be seen in practice in that the absorption of polymers is more kinetically favorable. So we get very quick, rapid absorption of silica. But over time, the silica concentration starts to go back up again. And that's because we see depolymerization of those chains. Um, so the timing becomes very, very important, as I said at the bottom point here. Um, Absorption processes on just about any material seem to be maximal in the same range according to the literature, somewhere between 8 and 10, with 9 being an absolutely perfect point for a lot of different materials. Now, this knowledge doesn't necessarily come from the water literature. Um, it actually comes from soil scientists who have investigated how things interact with soils and groundwaters for a very long time. And in particular, this work has come from Alexander McKeague, a Canadian soil scientist who did this work back in the 60s. Um, he looked at a range of different hydroxides and different materials to see how monosilicic acid was interacting. And effectively, we've then equated that to, an, to a removal efficiency. And we can see that things like ferric hydroxide, cobalt hydroxide, are very good at removing silica. Um, all of these materials perform quite well. He did do a lot of other ones further down um, this list. It's a, quite extensive list of materials that are a lot worse at absorption processes and some that will actually release silica instead. What's important to keep in mind is that some of these materials like cobalt hydroxide, for instance, or nickel hydroxide are not necessarily ones we want to be using on site for absorption processes. We want to be using materials that are going to be either easily available, cheap, and not likely to cause any other sorts of byproducts in the water we're producing. So the ones that tend to receive a lot more attention from our point of view are things like aluminium hydroxide and ferric hydroxide. Um, there's been a lot of work looking at different types of iron um, minerals, and it's been found that you can get greater absorption on the iron hydroxides than you do on ferric hydride than you do on gothite. And that ultimately comes down to the amount of hydroxide groups available on the material and how the silica interacts. Um, there is a very similar way of or absorption capacity data for aluminum, aluminium based materials. There are two important things that were discovered by the Japanese when they were looking at this sort of work, however, and that is that polymerization leads to hard, glassy silica on iron based adsorbents. What that means is the reaction is very quick and it forms that glass like scale as it as greater polymerization occurs. Now, the reason this is different from what I was describing before, where we see polymers absorb and then depolymerize, that's a batch process. In this case, we've got a constant feed of silica coming in, which is going to drive the polymerization process. So we end up with a very significant degree of polymerization on the iron-based material. Whereas on the aluminium-based materials, they found that it was a very soft, gelatinous silica. Now, from our point of view, we want to try and consider materials that we can regenerate a lot easier. A glassy, hard silica is not going to be easy to remove from the surface of the sorbent, whereas a soft, gelatinous silica is likely to be a bit easier to get at. So we can treat these sorts of materials with sodium hydroxide, remove them more efficiently, hopefully, and then put our material back in. So that is ultimately what led to the decision to look more at the aluminium hydroxide or the aluminium-based adsorbents than the iron-based adsorbents. Importantly, however, as well, is how we remove it, and that is the solubility. We generally would use a pH change. There probably are other techniques. And what you're looking at here is just a range of different materials that were considered good sorbents and their solubility in different ranges. Um, you can see here amorphous uh, alum, aluminium hydroxide and gibbsite are fairly highly soluble at that 9 and above, whereas, um, sorry, it was gamma alumina that was fairly highly soluble. Gibbsite is slightly less soluble, and so that would be a better target for use. Um, you can also see the ferry hydride is very insoluble. Um, manganese hydroxide, which we didn't want to use, as I explained before, just to avoid some of the, the potential cost considerations and the problems downstream. 
nickel hydroxide for the same reason. Um, this material here is actually gothite, uh, which is one of the iron-based ones, but as I said, very fast reactions, very hard scales, probably not as regenerable as the aluminium-based ones. Seeded precipitation is very, very popular in geothermal brine treatment, um, particularly in Japan and New Zealand, where they do a lot of this sort of work. Effectively, what they're doing is they're using silica gel, putting it into the solution, and absorbing. There is very little difference between what we call seeded precipitation for silica and what we call absorption, because the processes overall are the same. The only distinction I'm using here is that seeded precipitation uses silica as the material that does the absorption process. Um, it's very, very useful for removing monomeric silicic acid, but was found to be less useful for the polymerics and larger, of course, colloidal material. Um, there's a lot of research done into this which found that larger pores are more effective at removal, so you want something that has a high large pore volume, um, but it does leave a lot behind as well because it's based around the solubility more than anything. Having said that, um, the Japanese process uses colloidal silica as the seed. At 90 degrees, they add a little bit of lime and they're able to reduce the silica from 520 down to 10 parts per million. So that's one of the reasons why we were interested in using seeded precipitation as a potential um, material or a potential way of reducing silica content. Um, interestingly, the silica that gets produced in these ways is often quite pure, um, and some of the techniques in New Zealand do I think, a touch of refinement and then sell the silica to be used as a paper filler. The other process is iron exchange, and the um, important thing here to understand is that its own silica is very weakly ionic. So a traditional type 1 resin like what's shown here does not necessarily interact well with silica. It also has a very low selectivity because of the, the low interaction, the low ionic nature. So in while we can use this sort of material probably in a, as a polishing step for boilers, it's not suitable for brines where we've got significant quantities of other materials. Also, regeneration becomes a problem with these materials, particularly if we keep passing silica through and we end up getting polymerization. So we need to make sure we regenerate it at the right time. What was found, however, back in the 70s by the Soviets was that we could use zirconium hydroxide as a way to try and enhance the absorption capacity and the selectivity towards silica removal. And that is what is currently being used in the resins developed for chloralkaline, blood, sorry, chloralkaline brine treatment. So these are very highly salty solutions where we've got large quantities or significant quantities of sulfate, iodide, and silica that need to be removed. And these resins have been developed for that type of removal um, by a British company. The material that we were using in our study is one of these zirconium hydroxide enhanced iron exchange resins. Now, that particular iron exchange resin didn't work very well in the current study. They have actually modified it recently, they've told me, and they feel that it will work a lot better now. They were having some problems with the solubility of the zirconium hydroxide. So that it's one area that is still under development at the moment. Okay, so to conclude, what we took from the literature for our own work was that the sites that we've got under consideration have four possible approaches. Adsorption based on alumina, seeded precipitation, enhanced iron exchange, and high recovery at low pH. Importantly, there were a lot of gaps that we've found in our understanding of silica chemistry. And we feel that there needs to be further investigation of silica characterization, silica interaction with brines, and a lot more on some of the scale formation mechanisms. Because as it is at the moment, anti-scale use for silica is very hit and miss. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it all comes down to our understanding of what silica is actually doing. Um, we're using this knowledge, we need to use this knowledge to get a greater understanding and target better removal techniques and anti-scale and selection. And we've got this PhD project that we're just starting up now that is designed to start looking in this sort of area, but we really want to enhance our research capacity in that field. 
Um, importantly, we want to get a better understanding as well of silica interactions with membranes. We've got a modelling group that are very interested in doing this sort of work, and that's one way, that one path that we're going to go down. But of course, we need to bring all the um, practical data in with that to prove exactly what's going on. So acknowledgements, of course, to the National Centre of Excellence in Desalination, um, and also our industrial partners, Origin Energy, Hatch Australia, and the NARA Resources, as well as the list of people who were involved in this part of the project. So thank you, and I invite any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions? I have one just to start it off. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned you mentioned uh, a membrane that you use, which allows silica to pass. Mm -hmm. um, and in the electrodialysis mode. Okay. First, yes. uh, what kind of membrane is it? Okay. Um, effectively, it's a commercially available membrane. Um, it's a nanofiltration membrane. So what they're really doing is using it's either tight nanofiltration or loose RO, depending on how you want to look at it. And it's being used, you've got your electrodialysis unit that's generating your brine, and it's just being used to recover more water from that brine. So it's outside of the electrodialysis unit. It's supposed to be very effective. They did go to a couple of the manufacturers, and I've talked to a lot since after discovering this. And one manufacturer said that they were able to do this sort of work and allow the silica to pass through their membrane while still getting a decent rejection of salts. Not, of course, perfect, but a decent rejection. That's interesting. Um, generally, silica is non-ionic. Under most conditions. Yes. yes. So how are you causing silica to pass through the membrane? Well, it's in a reverse osmosis mode there. Okay, so you're not applying. It's not in potential. the electro, no, not in the electrodialysis unit. That's a separate setup. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Any other questions, Wendell? Yeah, I'm trying to. Um, I'm grappling with the objective spitters. They don't want to produce any sludge. Yet at the same time, um, they're willing to produce a regenerate solution from an ion exchange or regeneration of alumina or whatever it happens to be which in effect is generating a, a, a sludge in their evaporation ponds. So um, what, what is the rationale here? <laughs> but be careful in case they're listening. Um, <laughs> effectively what the question was was the, the rationale behind avoiding the production of a sludge but ultimately using a process that will produce a liquid waste stream. Um, from what I can understand, what it comes down to is the sites are just more comfortable and more confident dealing with a liquid waste stream that they can dispose of in exactly the same way as they currently do their waste, rather than a sludge that they feel they would need to take extra steps to remove. Um, I don't think they want to go through the dewatering process for a sludge, uh, which is the, the other concern, um, and that, that is another reason why they're trying to avoid sludge formation in general. Well, that said, like, oh, would they be amenable to a a um, liquid story. Something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was was about to um, comment about whether they'd be amenable to a liquid slurry as one way of potentially also accepting what's going on. Um, effectively, we were, I suppose, almost working for the client and their client. There, the the one important claim was that there'd be no solid formation, no solid sludge. Hmm. Well, that's set up. <laughs> uh, yes. Sorry, this begs the second question then. What's the ultimate fate of the silica? The silica, um, uh, the question was what is the ultimate fate of the silica? Um, ultimately, the silica gets pulled out with the regenerant, um, regenerant solution, so it's discharged discharge as in ultimately in the soluble form and goes out to the evaporation ponds. The whole aim behind the project isn't to go necessarily to zero liquid discharge, it's just to reduce the amount of evaporation ponds they currently have. So it, it probably comes more down to the fact that they want to reduce the amount of investment that is required. They currently are already, they're already having to build these evaporation ponds anyway. They'd like to produce something that can just go straight into those evaporation ponds. 
the silica would be going there anyway, and it would be falling out as solid along with the sodium chloride. So that seems to be the thing, the thinking behind what they're doing. I presume they'll never clean the ponds. Yeah. We're going to have a glassy pond. Glassy pond. Skating. Skating. Well, that's an interesting glasses. Interesting story. Um, are there any quite other questions? Yes, uh, Tom Hinkerbein uh, from Albuquerque has a question for you. He was wondering um, if there have been any studies on the use of titanium-based absorbents that you are aware of. Yes, um, the question was about titanium-based absorbents. Um, it did come under the soil science studies of Alexander McHugh, and from memory it was around 60% efficient. It was far less efficient than the aluminium and iron-based absorbents. Okay. Any other questions? Where? Um, Nick, thank you for that uh, fascinating talk. Well, there's, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around a fair bit of it. You, you mentioned uh, the induction time, and uh, it was it's somewhat variable. What sort of time are we talking about? Are we talking about seconds, minutes, hours? Um, effectively, that does come down to the variability. So the induction time. The question was about how, what the time length of the or the length of the induction time is. Under some conditions, it does drop to seconds or minutes. Um, it can be up in the hours range. In that low pH sort of work, we can go from memory for at least I think it runs for one or two hours before any sort of precipitation is seen. Um, there are some cases where it only runs for about half an hour and in the presence of some materials, it will drop down to well below that, into that minute sort of range. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's a very high, highly variable step. Um, there's a lot of theory behind chemically what they think is actually happening, because there are at least, there's one step at the beginning of the polymerization where things <coughs> seem to slow down, and there's a step a lot later on as well. Um, what they think at the beginning, or some of the theories out there that I quite like, is that the growth of the polymers beyond a trimer, tetramer sort of stage actually relies on the formation of cyclic polymers. Um, so instead of having the chains which are slightly more favourable to form, they need to form more of these cyclic materials and then the cyclic materials interact and that's what helps brings the polymerization further on. It's very new research, this sort of concept coming out. So whether how well it holds and whether it's true or not isn't entirely clear just yet. But it's a nice, I suppose, marries up a lot nicer in terms of the fact that it's got to um, got to be in the right confirmation before the polymerization can continue beyond that step. Now it'll happen more under certain conditions because more concentration means you're more likely to form more of these. Um, in the terms of the pH, it often comes down to just the reactivity. If you end up forming a lot more of the um, anions. At high pH, you can push the reaction a lot quicker, of course, because it is more highly reactive. Um, and you can form some of these chains a lot more quickly from them than you've done a little bit of more. Sort of work. But there, that's a very long answer for what could have been a very short one, I'm sorry, but uh, that's what it comes down to. May I follow up then? Sure. If, if that is the case where we've got uh, that is variable based on conditions, do we know enough about those conditions that we can actually control that induction time? Because if you can, then potentially, if the induction time is long enough, you can then have sufficient time to push it through a membrane process before you get the precipitation. Uh, so the question was um, with regards to do we know enough about the induction times to be able to design a technique to recover it? And the basic answer is effectively that's what Tony Tarquin at UTEP is doing. He's chosen that particular condition because it seems to be the most favourable in regards to how far you can push the um, the induction time out. If you were to pardon me, if you were to try using some of the other conditions, um, basically what you're trying to do uh, is potentially lower the temperature, find some of the right um, salts to add, which could be quite complex and could produce other interactions you're not necessarily expecting, um, or, well, supersaturation ultimately is beyond your control. So what you're trying to, the pH is probably the best one in to try and take control of in terms of induction time. 
Any other questions? Frank? I'm a mechanical guy and most of the chemical side of it is certainly uh, over my head with that, but I have a question that most of this research linked with, prob uh, with problems with silica refers to avoid precipitation within a row process. Keep it soluble or, or take it out before. My question is, is with these kinds of research, is there any link to mechanical approach that actually within RO process, not precipitation itself is the problem. The problem is adhesion to the membrane and uh, scaling. And it refers to silica and any other uh, scalars. Is there, I understand that all this research is linked with um, fluxes allowable by the membrane manufacturers, cross flows the same and so on. Is there any link of chemical approach with a mechanical approach that may maybe we can have something precipitated within the membrane, but if it goes through, it's not actually the problem. Um, so for the benefit of those online, the question was effectively asking if there are well, while, we're, while I've been talking today about chemical approaches to silica control, what sort of um, mechanical approaches could there be, um, particularly in allowing things such as colloidal silica to pass through a system rather than adhere? Um, and there is scope for a lot of research in this sort of area. And some, <coughs> while some of the, the interactions of life fouling, for instance, might have some differences, there is also silica style formation as a result of life fouling. I ignored all of that in this talk, by the way. Um, because it was just becoming way too complex as it was. But in the um, thermal desalination techniques, yes, they actually do design specific apparatus to try and avoid adhesion of silica. Now, there is ways that we could potentially take some of that and use cross-flow velocities, for example, to try and minimise that sort of interaction. The problem is that from a mechanical point of view, there are certain types of scale we'd be able to avoid but there would be other types that we would still suffer from. Things like monomer adsorption processes, um, which is another major, prob major cause, is still going to happen even if we manage to find a way to stop our colloidal attack. We still have that monomeric problem. And um, in general, that monomeric silica, attack, uh, silica um, scale formation is a lot worse for us in the long run than the colloidal. The colloidal can be dealt with to an extent. Um, so there is a way that we could marry some of these techniques together for full control of silica scale, but it needs to basically be a combination of both sides. That makes sense. Okay, thank you for that. Yes? Um, I've got another one from uh, Tom Hinkbein. He's wondering if there are any materials that might control, might control silica polymerization. Okay, so the, the question was about if there are any compounds that can control silica polymerization. Um, that is where some of the anti-scalant technology ultimately comes in. Anti-scalant technology not great at this point in time, and my understanding is that general understanding of silica anti-scalant chemistry is not particularly great either. Um, there are certain compounds, um, organic-based compounds, that do help to, I suppose, lower the reactivity. Similar to um, the answer I was giving about the interaction of organic compounds, the fact that organic compounds seem to interact with that anionic material and prevent adsorption. That type of technology is what is partially used in silica antiscale and control. Um, it's the same sort of rough concept, but it's got to be very carefully targeted towards the right sort of groups for attachment. Um, there's also a lot of research going on into ways of removing the more glass-like silica without using fluorides, using some of these compounds as well, alternative compounds. Um, having said that, I've trialled a couple in the lab unofficially, and we haven't had much success ourselves in trying to remove silica scale that way. Any further questions? 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.